morning. My name is Alexis Schaus. I'm the Director of School Business at the Department of Public Instruction and was asked to provide an overview of how the current schedules, um, the current school-based administrators are paid. Um, as an abbreviation, we refer to these as SBA. That includes the assistant principals and the principals. We have um, in, your hand, in your materials, you have two handouts to go along with this presentation. One is a uh, kind of detail of the history from 1993 to current day of how we got to where we are with how the, the SBA are uh, structured, as well as the 2016-17 legislative salary schedule. I'm going to go along with a PowerPoint here to, to simplify things. So it started very simply that um, in the 19, uh, early 19. 1990s, we had uh, set up school-based administrative schedules that were linked to the teacher schedules. We had the bachelor teacher schedule set by legislation, and then teachers received a 10% differential based on a master's degree, and the assistant principal schedule was linked at 1% above the teacher schedule, and principals who are classified based on the size of the school were then uh, a staggered schedule that was linked to the assistant principal schedule. Without getting into too much of the details, as you have that in your handout, there, during various legislative sessions, there are adjustments made to these schedules that have, uh, at the time, I'm sure, and, um, were intended to enhance, enhance the schedules, but have complicated uh, the situation. So there were, in the 1998 to 2000, there were safe schools and ADC incentive bonuses that were recurring that were um, included in the SBA salaries, wherever they went. There were exceptions to classifications of the scale based on the school, for instance, the alternative schools and the corporate innovative that have a low teacher count, um, but could be complex and specialized. There was the national board pay that was introduced that provided 12%, which increased the teacher schedule um, and uh, then made that, those individuals pay higher than the assistant principal schedules, and we'll get into that a bit later. During 2009 to 2014, there were five years where all state employees had frozen salaries um, and the schedules were frozen. In 2014, there was a severing of the tie of the teacher schedule from the SBA schedules. And then as a result of that, uh, legislative put it into place a no loss in pay because the teacher schedules are often, in most cases, higher than the SBA schedules. Going specifically into the assistant principals, we have approximately 2,800 um, assistant principals in the state. They are all required to hold a master's in school administration. They are paid very similar to the teachers and instructional support, meaning that the main differentiation is based on years of experience. They do not earn principal educator experience, which is specific experience that goes on a principal license and um, prior to 2009 accelerated the, uh, the rise to the top of the scale. And they are eligible for longevity pay unlike the teachers and instru instructional support positions. There are two exceptions to the, um, to the base pay. Uh, firstly, and I spoke about this before, was the in 1998, 1999, and 2000, uh, the General Assembly had uh, incentive pay of 1% based on the academic results of the school and a 1% pay increase based on safe school indicators. Uh, these are in place uh, currently it, because it was three years. There was a total of 6% that the uh, SBA could uh, earn during those years. And we have approximately 6% of our state funded assistant principals that are still in the school districts now being paid off those schedules. The second exception is um, it, it's a provision that was actually put in place in 2009 based um, because of the national board pay. Uh, it would allow assistant principals to carry their national board pay uh, to their assistant principalship. Since 2014, when the two schedules, the teacher schedule and the SBA schedules were severed, it applied to um, pretty much every assistant principal. So there is a loss, uh, no loss in pay provision that allows an assistant principal to be paid on the higher of the teacher's pay in that LEA 
or the assistant principal pay in that LEA. And as you can see that we have, just looking at um, the school, uh, excuse me, the state pay, uh, approximately 99% uh, of the assistant principals may be eligible to be paid on the, um, on the teacher schedule. Putting this um, as an example, if you look at an assistant principal with 16 years of experience, uh, the state pay as a teacher, and again, this does not include, does not account for the local supplement effect on this, uh, they would receive 4,978. For the same years of experience as a master, both of these individuals hold master's degrees, uh, the assistant principal would be eligible for a state pay of 4,556. So under that provision, this uh, individual would be paid based on the teacher's schedule. If you had an individual in the school district that had not met the requirement of passing a course for a master's degree by August 1, 2013, they would not be eligible to be paid as a teacher on the master's schedule. That was um, new teachers with a new master's are not eligible for the 10% differential. So in this case, uh, the individual would be eligible to be paid, um, it would only be eligible to be paid on the bachelor's degree pay at 4,525 versus the assistant principal pay at 4,556. So this individual with the same number of years of experience and the same education qualifications as the prior example would be eligible for a lower state base. There are other issues. Um, the bottom scale with the freezing of the schedules, uh, we had this with the teacher schedules um, also, uh, and we also have it with the principal schedule, is that each year that the schedules were frozen, a year was added to the bottom. So instead of moving off the bottom, scale, bottom step uh, after four years, uh, it now takes um, your 10th year, of, 10th year of experience to move off the bottom step of the assistant principal scale. We have about 10% of our assistant principals are paid on that bottom step. Uh, at the other end of the scale, for each year the, the schedule was frozen, an additional year was added to the top of the scale. So we now have 36 years to reach the top earning potential of an assistant principal. Moving to the principals. They are paid slightly different. They are paid determined, their pay, or rather their classification is determined based on the number of state-funded teachers and structural support and assistant principals employed, uh, employed in the school. Uh, there are eight classifications, and you can see that in your handouts, you'll see all eight classifications with the ABC bonus of the one to six percent. And then um, along the steps, they do have steps that uh, relate to the number of educated years of experience plus one additional year of credit for every three years they were a principal prior to July 1, 2009. So um, the extra, for every three years you were a principal, you used to receive a kind of a bonus step. So it wasn't in effect a, a year of experience, but it was kind of more like a longevity uh, step for being a principal. That was uh, stopped in July 1, 2009 when the schedules were frozen. Those were not, that extra step was not funded. And then in 2014, it was eliminated. They also, similar to the assistant principals, could earn the uh, ABC and Safe Schools bonuses. And we have about 12% of our, approximately, we have approximately 2,500 principals, one for every school that has either seven F state paid FTE or 100 students. Um, since 2013, I believe you have to have 100 students now to have a principal funded by the state. And the uh, principals are eligible for <coughs> longevity. There are exceptions. Um, as I stated before, um, in legislation, it states that if it is an alternative school or a cooperative innovative high school, the principal is funded at a minimum of a principal three. So this is to recognize that although they have a low number of state-funded uh, employees, or actually just a low number of employees, 
that uh, they may be harder to recruit for or have special skills needed to meet that um, those particular schools. A provision was put in place um, a couple of two years ago uh, for principals also to be eligible for the no loss in pay um, provision where they can also be paid on the hire of being a teacher in that LEA or as a principal a principal in that LEA, so um, they uh, they also could earn that. So looking at a comparison of the schedules here, um, a teacher with a master's pay uh, is the state salary schedule is at for a principal uh, excuse me for a master's pay is six thousand two two two. If the teacher um, didn't meet that cutoff of August one two thousand thirteen, then they would be eligible for 5610 and the assistant principal pay for 25 years would be 5126 and then a principal three is 5266 so uh, a school district has to go through each individual and assess under all these kind of different um, events uh, what the individual would be eligible to be paid I want to keep in mind that um, I've kind of almost simplified this if you can believe that but uh, under the first two, we actually have teachers that are under the whole harmless clause um, for longevity pay. So that may, they may be eligible for uh, a different amount than what is on the teacher scale based on the whole, whole harmless of their longevity. So other issues that, um, uh, or rather kind of making a summary of some of the issues that the the current pay scale does not often reflect how the LEAs are putting their local salary schedules for principals and assistant principals uh, to recruit the people that they need into the schools. As I stated, the classifications are based on state-funded employees, uh, but for a school district, they may need to hire, really recruit harder for those Title I schools so they have a higher percentage of federally funded Title I teachers that is not recognized in those classifications, so maybe providing a different scale um, than what the state is looking at. Uh, they also often uh, differentiate between the, the elementary, middle, and high schools. High schools are often more complex in nature uh, with many different more programs and harder to uh, recruit for. Uh, the other issues is just, uh, I think it's clear based on this presentation, the administration of trying to figure out what the uh, SBA is eligible for for state pay um, when you have 1,500 possible steps for 2,400, 2,500 positions. Uh, it can be quite complex as well as other no loss and pay provisions, et cetera. Um, so they do have to look at each uh, individual uh, as an individual to assess what they should be paid. The top of the scale, um, I stated that uh, we have, during those five years of where pay was frozen due to the um, budget issues, that each step, uh, excuse me, for each year, an additional step was increased. So now the principal pay, principal schedules go up to 46 years of, um, well, there's really 46 steps, I guess. Uh, and in addition, because of those, those freezings, as there was a dilution of every step, meaning back in 2009 for a principal three, uh, there, the step would have been 5,383. In 2016, it's actually 5,266. So in effect, in those seven years, uh, the school districts have $1,400 less recruiting power for the same number of years of experience of, um, for a principal. I don't know if you have to take any questions. 